Hi everyone, this is uh, Phil Travis, and um, this week's lesson is on ancient Egypt, oftentimes referred to, uh, the, this early civilization oftentimes referred to as the gift of the Nile. So first of all, let's consider why Egypt would be called the gift of the Nile, whereas um, Mesopotamian culture, uh, which we spoke about the week prior, um, is not sim similarly called the gift of the Tigris and Euphrates. So the reasons why we generally uh, consider um, Egypt the gift of the Nile River is because the Nile River was, you know, in comparison to a river like the Tigris, it was a very predictable uh, river. It, it flooded predictably. The floods provided like a self-fertilization of the soil as the Nile silt would be deposited during the flood times of the year in the um, in the uh, in the floodplains, and the Egyptians would then uh, go into these areas and uh, and sow their crops. So, in one respect, the Nile River very much uh, facilitated stable and organized agriculture in Egypt. And, and was far less destructive than many of the unpredictable flash floods that would have been plaguing the people of Mesopotamia. The river is smooth in the area around Egypt. Um, Egypt is located below the six cataracts. Um, cataracts are, are, are rapids, uh, waterfalls, if you will. Um, if you see on the map uh, in Nubia, which is basically Sudan, modern Sudan, um, Nubia, which also was over time influenced significantly by Egypt, um, and there's many small pyramids in Nubia. Um, Nubia was um, above the cataracts of the Nile River, and Egypt was below them. And so what this, what this means is that basically all of upper and lower Egypt were in a, peer, in a part of the Nile River that was smooth flowing. And this could be used to, um, to move items for commerce, up and down the river, um, and it also provided a natural barrier to Egypt. Once Egypt's united, it provides a natural barrier um, against uh, potential um, expansion of the influence of the people of Nubia. Upper Egypt, of course, is in the south, and lower Egypt, of course, is in the north, and that's because the Nile River flows um, north. And so the delta, which you see in Lower Egypt, is actually the area that we would call Lower Egypt. When we contrast Egyptian religion to Mesopotamian religion, you find a very interesting contrast. Um, and it has a lot to do with geography. Um, Sumerian religion, if we remember from last week, uh, was very negative, very pessimistic. Um, the gods were angry. They punished them with, with horrible floods. Uh, raiders attacked them, and as a result, Sumerians developed a religion that was rather pessimistic when it came to the place of humans in, in the afterlife. Um, for Sumerians, humans could not obtain eternal life. By contrast, in Egypt, Egyptians have a very positive view of existence and the afterlife. Um, Egyptians believe that not only are they the intermediary between the gods and and, and earth, but also that humans may ultimately, through the process of mummification and other religious processes, um, gain entry into eternal life and gain entry into the realm of the gods. Both religions, of course, are very polytheistic, multiple gods, but uh, Egyptian religion tends to be much more positive in nature in terms of view of eternal life and the afterlife than um, than the Sumerian uh, religious faith. And we believe this has a lot to do with the fact that, that the Egyptian society was relatively, um, was relatively insulated from uh, many of the dangers that afflicted Sumerian culture. Um, e Egypt was located below the cataracts, and so they didn't face raiders from the south. Um, Egypt was, was on one side. To the east, it was flanked by the Red Sea. And to the west, it's flanked by the Sahara Desert. And so these make uh, the presence of raiders from these areas um, almost impossible. So geographically, Egypt was very well protected. In addition to that, the Nile River's predictable flooding provided a very a relatively stable and predictable form of existence. And this, we believe, 
led to the uh, development of a more positive um, understanding of religion and of the afterlife for Egyptians. Um, in Egyptian religion, the religion centers on many gods and many, many deities, but oftentimes deities are generally uh, represented in the form of animals. Um, the hawk god Horus, who is depicted in this relief to the right of the relief, the far right, um, the hawk god Horus is almost always pictured um, in the presence of the pharaoh. Um, the Egyptian mythology also largely centers on a narrative that comes out of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is a, um, a narrative of the mythology of Egyptian re religion that was discovered inscribed on the walls of, of the monuments in Egypt. And um, the Book of the Dead tells the story of Seth, Osiris, and Isis. In the story, to make this long story short, Seth murders Osiris and chops his body up into pieces and throws him into the river. And Isis, she finds Osiris and tries to bring him back to life. She tries to put him back together and bring him to life. Ultimately, she fails. Osiris becomes the god of the underworld. And Osiris becomes responsible for judgment of humans. He becomes associated in, religion, in, uh, in Egyptian religion with the controlling of the floods, the fertility of the Nile. He's a, a, a good deity responsible with being the intermediary of a person into, into heaven, if you will. He's considered the individual who uh, allows Egypt for stability through predictable and uh, productive flooding, which brings fertility to the land. By contrast, Seth is often associated with being the evil entity in Egyptian religion. And Seth is oftentimes represented as a hippopotamus. The hippopotamus was, even though we might think about the hippopotamus as a sort of um, almost like playful creature, um, if any of you grew up watching commercials of the, of the game Hungry Hungry Hippos, uh, but the hippopotamus actually was the most dangerous animal um, in ancient Egypt. Uh, the hippopotamus uh, could kill a man and did kill men. In fact, the first uh, king to unite Upper and Lower Egypt, King Narmer, um, actually, we believe, was killed by a hippopotamus. Hippopotamus have tremendous, uh, tremendously powerful jaws, and in the water they can move very quickly. And, um, and, and they, could, they were ferocious and fearsome animals, and oftentimes that is the form uh, that Seth takes um, in, represented in, in, in his representation as an animal. So Egyptian religion is polytheistic. It is connected to the entities of the environment and of nature. The supreme deity, the supreme deity for Egyptians, like many ancient religions, is the sun god. Um, the sun god takes on many different forms and variations. Uh, the first is the god Amun, which is the sun god. Later in the New Kingdom, you'll see the development of Amun-Ra or Amun-Re. Uh, there's also the god, the sun god Aten which is the sun disk god. Egyptians, of course, also practice mummification. Um, Egyptian, Egyptian pharaohs would, of course, be mummified and placed in state in, in, a, in, a, in a burial chamber. Um, and this was believed to be, um, this was believed to be um, a critical, critical process in allowing the pharaoh to obtain um, eternal life. The chronological phases of ancient Egypt are generally broken up into uh, four broad areas, though I will actually mention that these are actually, there's more periods in the phases of ancient Egypt, but these are the ones that we're really going to look at. Um, the first phase is the Archaic period, and this is the period in which Egypt, Upper and Lower Egypt, are united. This is the period in which the first pyramid was built, um, the period of the Old Kingdom which is the, pyramid, the period in which the, the great pyramids of Egypt were built, the Middle Kingdom, and then the New Kingdom. And it's the New Kingdom that's associated with many of the pharaohs that you might be aware of from the Bible, for example, like Ramses the Great. Uh, if indeed there was a, uh, a historic biblical exodus, it would, have, it would have happened during the New Kingdom. Uh, the New Kingdom was a period in which Egypt became a great empire. Um, 
and there's tremendous building during the New Kingdom, though um, there are no pyramids built. Pyramid building is uniquely associated particularly with the Old Kingdom in Egypt. What you see here um, is part of what's called the Narmer Plate. Um, King Menes, or Narmer, was associated in 3100 BCE with the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. Um, Narmer means catfish or stinging catfish. And uh, this name der derives from the presence of a number of very, very um, feared and, 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 and painful, in terms of their sting, catfish that lived in the Nile River. Narmer, of course, unifies Egypt through war, and that's this this plate that you're looking at uh, depicts uh, Narmer smiting an enemy. The capital is created at, at Memphis, and Narmer creates himself as a divine absolute monarch who is an intermediary between the sun god Amun and the people of Egypt. The primary job of the pharaoh was to maintain ma'at, as it's called, which basically means uh, order, to maintain stability between humans and the cosmos, humans and the universe. Uh, doing this was absolutely integral to uh, the survival of Egyptian culture and society. Uh, remember, in today's day and age, we are a scientific people. What we believe to be true, what we believe to be um, important for our stable functioning as a world, our way of knowing, if you will, is based on science and scientific observation. In the early phase of human history, for mo most of human history, the primary way of knowing is religion. And so uh, Egyptians are deeply religious and their religion is connected to their way of understanding the ebbs and flows of nature. And when we contrast uh, Sumerian religious belief versus Egyptian really religious belief, you can really see to the degree to which these religions um, varied as the Egyptian religion and the Sumerian religions are both polytheistic, but the Egyptian religion is much, much more positive. Belief in an afterlife, belief in a positive interconnection between the gods and people, whereas the Sumerians very much um, lacked a perspective of the afterlife and very much um, uh, doubted the ability of humans to obtain eternal life. The development of pyramids, pyramids of course, particularly during the Old Kingdom, uh, were used as the burial chambers for the pharaohs. Um, pyramids are not always used as the burial chambers for pharaohs, and the greatest pharaohs in terms of building uh, actually were not buried in pyramids. Um, but the during the Old Kingdom, uh, pyramids were the primary burial chamber for the greatest pharaohs. Um, these burial chambers began as uh, mastaba. The first burial chambers were not pyramids. They were instead something called a mastaba, in which the pharaoh's um, burial tomb would be located underneath, as you see depicted here in this image, underneath the, the, the top of the mastaba, which is a sort of trapezoidal um, uh, constru stone construction. And these provided the basis for pyramids like this. This is the step pyramid of Zosier, which is the, which is really the first pyramid that we know of, uh, which comes right at the end and right at the beginning of the at the end of the archaic period and the beginning of the old kingdom. And uh, this is basically multiple mastabas stacked upon one another to ultimately create a pyramid. And this would have been done, of course, to signify the significance of the pharaoh's power. One of the great myths, at least this is a prominent theory, one of the great myths of pyramid construction is that they were built by slaves. Um, generally, it is accepted knowledge that the pyramids, while, while people who labored on the pyramids were not treated well all the time, uh, it was very difficult work and people were whipped and beat in building these. We've found evidence of this um, in the remains of individuals that um, would have been uh, pyramid labor. Um, but nonetheless, nonetheless, we believe that the labor was something called corvée, 
not slavery. And this labor, what does this labor mean? This means um, that it's a form of taxation, that rather than being held, held as a slave, that most of the pyramids would have been constructed by individuals who were Egyptian people and were providing a sort of necessary labor to the pharaoh as almost like a religious and societal taxation, a necessary duty for the religion of, of, of your world for the maintenance of, of the cosmos, of the Egyptian world, if you will. So it's believed that the people who labored on these pyramids would have been individuals that were effectively providing a sort of tribute tax labor rather than being sort of slaves proper. Now, for those of you who are sitting here and thinking, well, what about the Exodus? What about the Hebrew slaves? Well, the period in which there are Hebrews in Egypt, of course, at this time uh, of the old kingdom, the religion that we would call, you know, the Hebrew religion, uh, Judaism does not exist yet. But um, in the, in, at least in the traditional way of thinking about it, uh, the period that w the historical period in which you would have seen the development of Jewish law, the Ten Commandments, the Exodus, this type of thing is believed historically to have occurred during the new kingdom. Um, and particularly most likely during the time of Ramses the Great, which to give you some time frame is over a thousand years after this pyramid period. So what do pyramids tell historians about the period? Pyramids are themselves historical artifacts. They are in a way documents. And many of the pyramids and many of the building structures in ancient Egypt, of course, uh, provide written documentation right on their walls and on the relief. But even without that, uh, the pyramids themselves are documents. And generally, um, the size and the scale of building, and in the case of the Old Kingdom of pyramids, uh, really signifies the strength and the power of the king, the strength of Egyptian society, the strength of Egyptian um, economy, the power of the king to compel labor of his people. And so, in a nutshell, the bigger the pyramid, the more powerful the king. Uh, the bigger the pyramid, the stronger the state, in a way. Uh, though it doesn't necessarily mean that the people loved the king. In fact, the Great Pyramid, the Pyramid of Khufu, is associated with a king that many historians would regard as a very harsh and probably repressive leader. And here, of course, are the Great Pyramids of Egypt. The three Great Pyramids are Khufu, Khafre, and Menenkare. Khufu is the largest one, which, um, of course, was built by a king who many believed to be a very harsh leader, but signified the period of unprecedented strength in Egypt. Uh, the Great Pyramid of Khufu stands 481 feet high, and it was, to give you some perspective here, this Great Pyramid, um, the only remaining uh, remnant of what's, been, what's known as the Eight Wonders, or the, I'm sorry, the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, um, King Kong or Andre the Giant <laughs> were the eighth wonder of the world in the 20th century, if, if anybody re remembers those, uh, those references in modern pop culture. But um, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, of Khufu, which is um, still obviously standing today, um, it is the only of the seven wonders, only of the seven wonders of the ancient world that remains intact, was the tallest building in the world until the late 1800s common era okay so until until 150 years ago khufu was forever the tallest building ever built the second highest pyramid is khafre and these are your these are your 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 um, your classical pyramids at the giza plateau khafre is usually associated with the building of the sphinx uh, the sphinx is located adjacent to khafre and we usually associate the building of the Sphinx um, as something that was constructed with stones left over from Khafre's pyramid, though there is debates about this, and the dating of the Sphinx remains controversial. Menenkare's pyramid is the smallest of the three, and many historians believe that it signified a decline in the, in the power of the pharaohs during the Old Kingdom 
as as Menengkari was considered to be the most um, um, the kindest, if you will, uh, of of the, of the pharaohs. He very much sought, um, uh, if you will, to um, to be a humane and just leader. Um, in some respects, he was a more humble of the three, if this makes sense. And he, he built the smallest pyramid. And some historians suggest that that signifies uh, the beginning of the decline of the old kingdom and, and the decline of the pyramid, uh, the period of the building of these great pyramids. And there are many, many, many pyramids of many varying sizes. And it's just that the pyramids, uh, the step pyramid of Zosier being the first, and these more traditional pyramids at Giza, um, these are the ones that gain much of our focus but there's many 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 pyramids during the old kingdom and many of them have uh, sadly degraded tremendously due to wear and weather so then another question as we talk about it, how do Egyptologists know so much about the chronology of ancient Egypt as you think about that I'll show you a couple pictures here here's a picture of the Sphinx you can kind of get a perspective on the distance between uh, Khafre and the Great Pyramid of Khufu and also Menenkara. You can see the spacing there. Here is a, uh, a picture of Snefru's Red Pyramid. Another one of the most famous pyramids that you, you don't often hear as much about. But uh, one of the most idyllic pyramids that, uh, that one could see. The way that we gain knowledge about the pyramids, about the great kings of Egypt, is through uh, reliefs, writing that was written on the, um, uh, the monuments of ancient Egypt, and particularly the king's list at Karnak. Um, of course, it's partial, but um, what is remaining is the yellow. But the king's list at Karnak provides... Uh, provided for historians a chronology of basically every dynasty of Pharaoh. And this has provided us with a tremendous amount of knowledge of ancient Egypt. Now, one might immediately say, hold on a second, how do we decipher this language? Well, we deciphered the hieroglyphs, which you just saw on the uh, King's List at Karnak. We deciphered it through the, through the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was a document that was written by King Ptolemy V um, in 196 BCE. And so this is very late. This is during the Hellenistic period. This is long after the period of greatness of Egypt. Um, but the importance of this is that the old, uh, some of the old writing had survived and was still being used. And so on the Rosetta Stone, King Ptolemy V had had inscribed three different scripts. And these were the scripts. Scripts were in ancient Greek, the demotic, and the hieroglyph. And because, and because the other languages were, were known and understood um, by Europeans when this was discovered in 1799 by the French, when Napoleon was waging a conquest of Egypt, um, it unlocked the key. Uh, to, to deciphering the hieroglyphs and unlocking the mystery of the many, 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 many um, um, written documents on the, on the walls of, of Egyptian building. And of course, it was Jean-Francois Champollion who translated this um, in the 18th century. Uh, the most significant um, development in Egyptology because it unlocked the mystery of, 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 of many of the meanings of the kings and, um, and the developments in ancient Egypt. Now, of course, many things remain mysterious, but we have gained tremendous knowledge about the kings associated with various pyramids, about the kings associated with um, conquest, with controversy, and so forth um, through this document. So it's incredibly significant.